So I'm very pleased to introduce Angel Chatterjee um, in the first opening lecture of the symposium. Anjan is the founding director of the Penn Center for Neuroaesthetics. He wrote several books, including The Aesthetic Brain uh, and uh, Brain Beauty and Art, Neuroaesthetic in Practice and the Roots of Cognitive Neuroscience. He is or has served on editorial boards of several neuroscience, neurology, ethics, and aesthetic journals. He received the Geshwin Prize in Cognitive Neuro Neurology by the American Academy of Neurology and the Arkheim Prize for Contribution to Psychology and the Arts by the American Psychological Association. Anjan was uh, uh, the past president, is the past president of the International Association of Empirical Aesthetics and the Behavioral Cognitive Neurology Society. Um, Anjan, welcome to CUA and the symposium. Can you hear me okay with the mic? So. <clears throat> so I would also like to thank uh, Julio for organizing this uh, and Dean Ferguson and Catholic University uh, for uh, making this place and space available uh, and the Templeton Religion Trust uh, who supported this and support some of the work that I will allude to over here. So a few years ago, um, I was uh, giving, I was supposed to give a talk in Barcelona. And before the talk, I uh, had a day to play tourist uh, in the city. And I thought, you know, I had my checklist of all the things I needed to do in Barcelona. So I went to um, this place that many of you will uh, find familiar, especially in the context of the symposium. Uh, La Sagrada Familia, and my plan was to go there when it opened, stick around for a couple of hours, and then move on to, to do Barcelona. Um, I went in there when it opened, and I didn't leave until it closed. I ended up spending the whole day there. Um, the, the, the space, the play of light through the stained glass, the way the light changed across the day, uh, the difference environments in there uh, were so compelling uh, that at no point did I feel the need to leave. Uh, and so the question for us is, how is it possible that a constructed environment could do something like this? And why does it do something like this? And whether it's this environment or another, many of you have probably experienced something along those lines. And uh, the question is why and how? And when we ask this question, there are certain uh, issues that we uh, need to think about, and hopefully you'll think about it as I tell you my story. Uh, one is that we are an old brain in a new environment. So most of us think of our brains having evolved primarily through the Pleistocene, a little shy of 2 million years, but the constructed environment as we think about it, uh, uh, especially in urban contexts, we're probably about eight to maybe 10,000 years old. So we have a very, we have a, a, a problem, which is how is it that our brains that did not evolve for the kind of environments we find ourselves in now, and especially in, in the materially developed world, most of us spend uh, more than 90% of our time indoors. Uh, so what, uh, what kind of issues uh, does this disconnect between the birth of our brain and where we find ourselves right now? Uh, what kind of issues does that render? The second is a question of uh, variability. And if you're an experimentalist, variability is your friend uh, because this is how you try to understand uh, the structure of things. If there's no variability, there's not really much to understand. Uh, but there's a way in which you can think of a building in relation to how we think of the world in general. And broadly, we can divide the world up into people, places, and things. Our visual cortex recognizes this. There are uh, 
parts of the real estate within visual cortex that is dedicated to processing, uh, at least visually, people, uh, places, and things. And so uh, you can think about buildings in conversation with people, places, and things. And with things, it can be issues of interior design, and I won't really talk about that uh, in this talk. But uh, it is also in conversation with the people in the buildings. And people are different. So how do you how do you think about the way in which uh, a building serves, hopefully, to flourish, to help people flourish, to pe for people to be at their best uh, in, in that environment? Uh, and then buildings are also in conversation with the place in which they are constructed. And different places have different characteristics. Uh, you can think of this in terms of sustainability. You can think of this in terms of environmental studies. Uh, in some places, uh, like uh, Uluru, shown at the bottom left, itself probably has on the order of 20, 30, 40,000 years of a kind of a sacred resonance uh, for people who are there. So if you're building on those kinds of spaces, how does your building communicate? How's your, how does your building, how, what is uh, the relationship of your building to nature? So these are the kinds of broad issues that kind of hover in the background uh, as, as we approach this uh, in an empirical fashion. So most of you uh, will know this, uh, especially the architects. So Vitruvius, first century BCE, wrote a, a 10 volume treatise in architecture. It's always a little humbling to see 10 volumes reduced to one figure. Uh, but this is the figure that people always talk about, and I always talk about. Yeah, he sort of thought about architecture as being, uh, as one could think about it in terms of the materiality, firmitas, uh, the materials of the building, its functionality, uh, and he separated out aesthetics from that. And arguably for the first uh, uh, good portion of the 20th century, functionality and aesthetics were conflated. Uh, for very good reasons, but uh, I think uh, some of the architects in the room may uh, have thoughts about how and why more recently those are starting uh, to get uh, uh, get separated a little bit. When we think about aesthetics, uh, we have argued that a framework, uh, it's not really a theory, it's more of a framework with which to think about aesthetic experiences are that they are an emergent property of the kind of sensory motor features of something one might be engaged with, uh, the, the response, the emotional response, which seems to be key, the kind of values we give uh, to uh, the objects we are engaged with. And then there's a way in which knowledge and meaning uh, comes to play, overlays on top of that. And when we think about a lot of the, the variability, uh, much of this comes from our backgrounds, our education, where we were raised, how we were raised, uh, that uh, plays into uh, plays into modulating our sensory systems, which are more similar than they're different, uh, and broadly our uh, emotions and valuation systems have, uh, have similarities, but perhaps with some differences. So that's the overall framework with which uh, we try to think about uh, when we're studying anything to do with aesthetic experiences. So the story I'm going to tell you began uh, some time ago. This was probably, uh, I don't know, 12 or 13 years ago. It was with a, a, a group of colleagues uh, where we got interested in asking a very, very simple question, which is, is it the case that when we respond to architectural interiors, are we tapping into the same reward systems, primitive core reward systems that our brain harbors in response to things like food and sex and these kinds of primary rewards. And so this was a, a, an experiment that uh, we had some Danish architects help us with uh, picking out stimuli and stimuli were varied along three dimensions, which is whether they were curvilinear, rectilinear, whether they were open or closed. By open, we meant that you could see past. It wasn't a cave-like structure, you could see past it. 
uh, and whether uh, the uh, the ceilings were low or high. So these are just three dimensions that in this case we varied. Uh, and the question was when people respond to these kinds of images in a scanner, uh, what, uh, again, are our core reward areas engaged uh, when we look at this? Uh, and the, the short answer is yes. And so what's being shown here is that uh, in this uh, image, sort of the medial prefrontal cortex, uh, that this part of ventromedial prefrontal cortex does seem to be activated as people think these, uh, these images of architectural interiors uh, are more beautiful. So that was a kind of finding uh, that, uh, you know, was sort of in the background. And then a few years ago, I had a, a um, a graduate student from Cambridge who came to my lab. Uh, it was a graduate student in architecture. He wanted to do some empirical work. And so we resurrected this, uh, this notion. And we went through what we could find in the literature of the kinds of questions people ask, whether it's around architecture or whether it's around uh, judgments or, or uh, responses to the environment and came up with these 16 psychological dimensions that are uh, asked about frequently. Um, so then we used the same set of stimuli that we had used in the imaging experiment uh, and had 800 people rate these images along these uh, dimensions. And when you do that, you can set up a kind of correlation matrix uh, that's shown over here. Uh, but uh, in some ways, something more interesting is we had started to get interested in uh, what in my world is sometimes referred to as network science methods, that there are these ways in which you can lay out uh, in a spatial array uh, the relationship of these different dimensions using math that I confess I don't understand, but it's always useful to have smart people with you who, who can figure this out. Uh, and this is what we end up with. Uh, which is that if you take each of those dimensions and play them out uh, in terms of uh, where uh, they lie on this space, uh, what we find is that these responses all cluster into three communities, three, three broad uh, areas, uh, which we are calling coherence. Coherence is really how organized is the space, how legible is it, is it how structured is it, uh, fascination, which is how interesting is it? Do you feel like you want to explore it? How informationally rich is it? And hominess, uh, which is the sense that you belong there. We've all probably been in places that are fascinating, uh, maybe even coherent, but we just don't feel comfortable there. And so this seems to be an important dimension as well. And right in the center of this, of these three dimensions, is valence. And valence is really the most basic notion of do you feel good or do you not feel good, right? So that seems to be really central uh, to this. Uh, we uh, also did some more conventional uh, statistics on this, like principal components analysis, which if uh, people may be uh, familiar with that, and basically we're able to show that 90% of the variance and how people responded, this is among 800 participants, were accounted for by these three uh, by these three dimensions. We replicated that behaviorally and felt that that was we were reasonably comfortable with this. And then we did something that uh, is the only time I have and probably ever will have uh, to do what essentially ended up being a double-blind experimental study. And what I mean by that is we had used these exact same stimuli in that imaging experiment that had been done a dozen years ago. At the time, we didn't know about these dimensions. The participants certainly didn't know about the dimensions. And what we could do is then use the same images and reanalyze the data from before that those data were collected in Tenerife. These data were collected in the US. We could go back to their original scans and reanalyze the data using these components uh, to see if there was a neural signature there. And sure enough, with an occipital cortex, we could show that there was a uh, there were segregated responses to 
uh, to fascination, to hominess, uh, and to coherence. Uh, and so what this tells us is that these brain responses were there the whole time, but neither we knew it nor the participants knew it. We didn't know to ask the question. And once the question revealed itself to us, we could actually detect what was going on in people's brains. Right? So one implication of that is that we are probably uh, responding to our built environment in ways that we are not aware of at the time. And if we don't know to ask the question, we don't know uh, that it might be worth measuring. So having taken uh, these three notions, uh, we wanted to ask, does this generalize? And does this generalize to different uh, populations? So this was a relatively small study we did. Uh, it was done in Italy. Uh, and uh, we took uh, people who were design students, and we we're particularly interested in uh, people who are on the autism spectrum. Uh, and the question is, do people all respond in the same way uh, to these kinds of stimuli? And the answer is not exactly. Uh, and what's particularly notable is that people on the, uh, on the spectrum uh, were not as affected by fascination the way neurotypical people were. And at least our, our explanation or our um, account of that is that people on the spectrum, for them, uh, things that are informationally rich might be overwhelming. And rather than make them feel comfortable with that, it actually uh, might not be uh, something that people are uh, on the spectrum are as comfortable with as people who are uh, as a neurotypical population. We also noticed that design students were particularly, uh, particularly focused on coherence, which is something that we have uh, we have uh, replicated, and that might have some implications uh, for as we talk about this. So then, so now we have these three components, uh, and uh, we were interested in whether this these components generalize to other domains. So up until now, everything we did were using the same set of stimuli that these, uh, that our architect uh, colleagues in Denmark had created. Uh, and so we took a different set of stimuli that were not curated by architects. Uh, they were used by another um, neuroscientist named Ed Vessel for a completely different set of studies where he used uh, both architectural exteriors, had a whole set of them, and, uh, and environmental images. And our question was fairly straightforward. Is how did these three components, uh, how did they play out if you're looking now not at these finely curated interior images, but external architecture and, uh, and the environment? And you know, many of you may know that uh, sort of this notion of biophilia that started with Eric Fromm has become quite popular in various design circles. Uh, and so this brings up the question of what's the relationship between nature and the built environment. So when we uh, look at these uh, and using the same kind of uh, network methods, what we find is we recapitulate uh, the same, uh, same three factors. Uh, but in natural landscapes, hominess and coherence seem to be more conflated uh, than they are when we're looking at uh, exterior architecture. And these are all neurotypical people, large numbers of them. Now, one thing that's particularly interesting here and to uh, highlight it is when we're talking about exterior architecture or architecture in general, people like naturalness to it. However, when we're talking about natural landscapes, people like order. And so there is this sense that in nature, or in the built environment, we want marks of nature. And in the natural environment, we want marks of humanity. Right? So there's a kind of permeability, a continuum going on between our relationship to our built environment and our relationship to nature. And so nature is not nature is not nature, that we want some taming of nature for us to feel most comfortable with it. Now, 
So these uh, were a set of studies that we've done. We have one more study along this, but it's always nice if uh, someone else uh, from a completely different lab uh, picks up on this to make you feel uh, feel a little better about uh, the validity of what you're trying to do. Uh, and fortunately, uh, Hugo Spears, who um, is a cognitive neuroscientist at the University of College of London, recently published this uh, using very different methods, which is he had uh, these about, you know, between uh, 25 and 30 second videos where people are uh, apprehending a video that's navigating through different spaces. Uh, and they're judging uh, the, the quality of those spaces uh, with respect to these three dimensions. And what he finds is this, that they replicate the importance of hominess coherence and fascination, and that in their population, using a very different method, very different stimuli, they also find that these are important for balance, the basics of whether we feel um, how we feel about the space. And the other thing they found was fascination specifically was more related to arousal. Uh, and like we found with spatial complexity, but arousal is something we hadn't looked at. And so whatever contributes to the notion of fascination seems, uh, seems to be linked uh, perhaps to our initial uh, sympathetic response uh, to an environment. And uh, relevant to that is, uh, I didn't put a slide of our last study that was just published of, uh, a, a few weeks ago, uh, in which we found that in, with very short exposures, up to a second, that the component that seems to be most important is fascination, and then the rest come a little bit later. Uh, and so it seems as though fascination is something you respond to very quickly. It makes sense that it might be a quick response in relationship to arousal. But this story uh, remains to be worked out. Uh, and in that, uh, in that experiment, we also found uh, that uh, architecture graduate students at the University of Pennsylvania, where I work, um, we contrasted them with law students. So the idea is that these would be students who were all educated. They were all high performing in a fancy school. And that, uh, but one group was really trained in architecture and the other wasn't. And what we find again is that the architecture students prioritize coherence more so than others. And so this raises a question, which is, uh, I mean, I'm not an architect. You guys know what your training is. But if you are designing for people who apprehend the space differently than you do, what do you do with that, right? Should you be in conversation with the people for whom you're designing? Um, so, but be that as it may, um, we'll leave it at that. So, so um, the last bit I wanna talk about is going back to this notion, uh, which is the theme of this symposium, like nothing here that I've talked about makes any direct contact with notions of, uh, of uh, being sacred. And to do that, I need to step back from this line and, and make you aware of a, 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 an adjacent line of work that we've been doing that is funded by the Temple, Templeton Religion Trust, parts of the, their Art Seeking Understanding uh, Aesthetic Cognitivism program. And when we started with this, we asked the question, uh, having read things that Professor Graham has written, uh, but starting as a scientist saying, well, what is understanding? Uh, and when we talk about art, what does that actually mean? Uh, but so for us, for our first step, we thought we might, what we probably need to do is to establish a kind of taxonomy, a language, a vocabulary of how we respond to things that might make contact with the way someone experiences art. And, and this is the part that's adjacent, I would argue that is similar to architecture uh, in a way that we're, we're trying to understand what is the experience of people when they're encountering art or architecture. And so to do this, we gathered a group of, uh, an interdisciplinary group of scholars that are all experts in, uh, in the arts. So Natalie Carnes is a theologian at Baylor, uh, who's particularly interested in 
the way that visual imagery is used in Christian theology. Uh, Matthew Milner is a, uh, I think his last name is Milner, I might have misspelled that here, uh, is, uh, is an art historian uh, who's, uh, uh, who is also interested in these kinds of issues. Ellen Winner is a psychologist. Uh, uh, some of you might know she wrote a, a, very, a fantastic book called How Art Works. Uh, if you want to read something about the psychology of art, it's probably the single book I think is worth reading. Uh, Noel Carroll uh, is a senior, uh, senior philosopher uh, who's uh, oh, quite a well-known philosopher of, uh, of art, uh, and I represented neuroscience. And the question where we started was two extended sessions. They were supposed to be uh, in person, uh, but then the pandemic happened. So unfortunately, there were these extended Zoom calls where we, we asked people to come up with as many words that they could think of, either describing works of art or, and separately describing the potential kind of impacts that art could have on a person engaged with art. Right? Come up with as many words as you can. We went through all of them uh, one by one uh, to kind of make sure we understood why the person was bringing up what they were bringing. Uh, and then we took what we ended up with were 121 descriptor words, and I'm not going to talk about that here, and 69 impact words, which is there were 69 terms that people felt uh, represented a way in which people responded to art, and the asterisk, I'm saying that probably applies to architecture as well. And then having gotten these words, we also then crowdsourced them. Yeah, you know, we had a large number, uh, close to a thousand people respond to each word and generate word associations from each word for over a minute. And then you can use these same kind of network analyses to ask the question is, in the semantic space of a broad population of people, what is the relationship of these words? And what we end up, uh, this is from the 69 uh, impact words, you get this kind of uh, uh, an image, and I can tell you, you can spend a long time just staring at this and zoning out on it and thinking about it. But for in, with using formal statistical ways, they seem to precipitate into about 11 different dimensions, uh, all the way from, if you look at the very top, these negative valence things, abrasive, provoking, disgusted, you know, and as you move around, uh, it starts to change uh, in tone. And with respect to this conference, I'm just gonna uh, highlight parts that I think are most uh, relevant, which is that, you know, you might say words like awe and wonder and transcendent are important aspects of what a, it means for a place to be sacred. And you see that those are clustered in this kind of light brown areas, but they're not far from hopeful, inspired, uplifted, uh, which is also not is adjacent to notions like illuminated, enlightened, revelatory, and so what this allows us to do is to say here's a set of here's a set of descriptors that seem to be the way people respond that we can in a kind of formalistic way divide them into clusters, and what this then allows us to do is when you are trying to construct experiments or trying to query what people's experience are you have a theoretically motivated way of doing it. You're not just sort of randomly asking people questions, that there's a background to why we think these questions are relevant and why we think this is important. And this is sort of where we're going with, with this right now. But I think, again, some of these terms uh, become relevant if, if questions, if the questions you're asking are the notions of, uh, you can see up at the top also notions of uh, responses of contemplative, thoughtful, empathetic, compassionate. This is sort of a different category of terms that are still related, but adjacent to odd wonder. And so the, the broad idea is if you ask the question of what does it mean to be sacred and try to deconstruct that, what are these kinds of terms? How would you, uh, you know, how would you, uh, how would you start querying this in an experimental way? So uh, that's uh, 
all I had to say. And what my I would leave you with these final take homes, which is I'm hoping that you would um, hold on to this notion of these three dimensions, coherence, fascination, and hominess when it comes to the built environment. Uh, there is a question of who and what is it being designed for. Uh, and this tension is kind of what I was alluding to, is that if people who are very well trained and designed actually experience spaces differently than the people for whom that space is designed, is there an inherent tension there? And is that something at least to be aware of? Right. Uh, uh, and then this question of nature and order, which I find quite fascinating, of this kind of permeability between the built environment and the natural environment, that there is a we like nature in the built environment. We like order in the uh, in the natural environment. And then, at least, we're hoping to push this idea that you know empirical aesthetics historically has uh, really asked pe whether people like things, whether they find it interesting, whether they find it beautiful. But trying to get past that into a kind of a more granular, uh, a more nuanced way of assessing how people respond uh, to the environment. So, thank you. Yes, of course. We're doing the panel. Yes. Okay, so uh, part of the symposium, as I said at the beginning, was to have a conversation. So every lecture will have three respondents. So let me then introduce the respondents and I invite them to move to the sitting area here. And then one by one, then you will uh, come to the podium and, and have a, uh, a points to be made uh, on Angel's lecture. So, Mohammed, uh, obviously, please. Um, uh, Milton Schimberg and uh, Richard Villadesu. Um, and let me introduce first uh, Mohamed Kobesi, who's going to do the first uh, response. Um, Mohamed Kobesi is professor and interim chair of neurology at uh, GW uh, University, George Washington University. He earned his uh, BS in mathematics and an MD from the American University of Beirut and a master's degree in English literature from GW. He pursued training in neurology at New York University and in epilepsy at John Hopkins. He has published 111 papers, edited four books on epilepsy and earned about 3000 citations. His honor include the innovation award from the engineering school at Case Western for deep brain stimulation research. His investigation on consciousness was featured in a 2015 National Geographic documentary that aired globally in over 50 languages. Uh, Mohammed, can you uh, come to foreign? Thank you so much uh, for inviting me um, and for your kind introduction. Um, and thank you, Professor Chatterjee, for the outstanding talk. I, uh, I have uh, some comments. So as uh, and I know I have five minutes, uh, but uh, as Julio said, I'm an epileptologist. So uh, the science uh, of the clinical science of epileptology involves treating the, you know, epilepsy, which is a, a disorder of abnormal electrical activity in the brain. And one subset of individuals with medically intractable epilepsy, that means people who have seizures that do not respond to medications, uh, necessitate implantation of electrodes within the brain to find the seizure focus in an you know in a in a in an attempt to remove it surgically, and this patient population with electrodes in the brain tends to be uh, the you know is actually my my research interest because a plethora of information can come from you know uh, intracranial recording, especially as regards um, functional localization of different brain regions including uh, uh, potentially identifying neural correlates or neural underpinnings of various phenomena, uh, which brings us to you know, the whole science of neuroaesthetics, which has been uh, uh, tackled beautifully by functional neuroimaging, but not by uh, uh, intracranial recordings. The reason I'm introducing this is just to tell you that my comments here are not um, about the whole talk of the, uh, of Professor Chatterjee, but about uh, certain things. First of all, uh, to uh, I want to show my uh, fascination of a brain structure called the insula, which is often the size, the site of seizure onset in individuals with epilepsy, and its relevance to uh, to neuroesthetics. 
Um, and second, I want to talk about uh, uh, from from the insula uh, uh, point of view about the uh, semantic uh, space uh, within a population and those associations, how how they happen, which Dr. Shatterjee uh, referred to also uh, towards the end. So a uh, very quick um, quote by uh, Wittgenstein uh, in his book on uh, you know uh, psychology and, and aesthetics and, and religion actually lecture notes from his students in England. He says, you might think aesthetics is a science telling us what's beautiful. I suppose it ought to include also what sort of coffee tastes well. Uh, there is a realm of utterance of delight uh, when you taste pleasant food or smell, uh, a pleasant smell. Uh, then there is a realm of art, which is quite different, though you often may make the same face when you hear a piece of music as when you taste good food. The impact words that Dr. Chatterjee harvested from the population may be relevant to what Wittgenstein is talking about here. Uh, but the, the association in this quote between the enteric nervous system, between the belly and the uh, and, and art is very interest is very interesting. Damasio, uh, Antonio Damasio in 2018, several decades later, wrote, it's intriguing to think that the enteric nervous system might well have been the very first brain. So the insula is an area that is important for taste. The insula is an area of the brain that uh, 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 processes taste, but it also processes uh, uh, appraisal of aesthetic stimuli. Uh, so it receives visceral sensory information from the enteric nervous system, and it's heavily associated and associate, heavily uh, uh, busy in or implicated in associating uh, uh, an affect to any perceived stimulus. The category of the aesthetic uh, concerns uh, experiences where informational units composed of affect, value, and cognition become reorganized by the situational demands for more nuanced knowing. Um, so uh, Dr. Shatterji, in one of his reviews, uh, uh, and many of you are aware, uh, uh, I, I think of a patient who um, had a stroke in the, um, in the uh, insula, and he was able to appreciate the tone and other uh, aspects of the music, but he stopped being able to enjoy, uh, to enjoy the music. Uh, we have, in epilepsy, we have multiple patients who have insular seizures during which they are able, uh, they feel pain, but without expressing uh, uh, the pain by grimaces or by mo any motor manifestation. And we have another, which are exactly the opposite. They feel as if they are in pain, but they don't. They don't. They, they don't experience the actual pain. All of these functions uh, uh, tell you about what the insula does uh, in terms of associating the uh, the sensory input with the motor behavior, but then with the affect. So before uh, you know, going astray and digressing much, uh, there is a study that actually uh, 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 there is a meta analysis indeed that was done by Brown et al. in two thousand eleven. Uh, when they looked at multiple uh, neuroaesthetic studies that involved not just visual uh, stimuli, but also uh, auditory and even olfactory and gustatory. And they found when they analyzed the images from multiple studies that the anterior dorsal insula in, on the left side was uh, consistently involved. Uh, finally, I just want to say that in, in daily language, uh, referring to something beautiful may always take some gustatory element. We always use the word taste for art. We used, uh, uh, you know, if something is ugly, we say it lacks taste. Uh, the, the, according to uh, some internet uh, survey, the most common word in 2018 of endearment was sweetheart and honey. So everything refers to the, to the, to the gustatory, which is probably... Uh, how the how the the way, but by the way the, I'm gonna stop here but the insula the, the, the way the way you associate uh, two things has also been studied in a famous science paper in the insula when people when they held like warm coffee they felt the other person was warm when they held cold coffee they did not feel the other person was warm so uh, there is something between the the warmth that is sensed by the insula and the interpersonal warmth. Like this is the, if you want the neural underpinnings of metaphor. So it works here with the insula when it comes to beauty. Uh, how does this relate to uh, hominess is something probably different. 
uh, but but very interesting. So uh, uh, the fact that two of the psychological constructs involved in our brain response to spaces are fascination and hominess is particularly interesting. Fascination may intersect with uh, processing of aesthetics, especially probably as may relate to the role of the insula among other brain structures. Hominess is probably more difficult to tell as regards the intersection of its neural underpinnings with those uh, of aesthetic experience. Interestingly, valence is at the center and valence is probably uh, uh, you know, uh, insula processed. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mohammed. Well, if I could just make a quick comment, yes, so, because I'll yes. forget after I listen to everybody yes. else. <laughs> so the insula is a fascinating area, as Mohammed mentions, and Steve Brown had this meta-analysis that you mentioned that uh, the insula shows up across uh, different kinds of sensory inputs. Uh, there's another piece to it, or, or two pieces. One is that when people do network, different kinds of brain network analysis, something that's is referred to as the salience network, the insula is a core node within the salience network. So this is something that's activated when whenever we apprehend anything that's salient, regardless of its valence. And then the, the, uh, the last point uh, that makes the insula fascinating uh, is that it is also the, the cortical part that controls our autonomic nervous system. So the sympathetic nervous system, the parasympathetic nervous system is organized uh, and mediated through the hypothalamus, but the cortical structure is the insula. So whenever we're talking about affect and arousal and you know, uh, some people in architecture, but talking about parasympathetic versus sympathetic tone, the insula becomes a really critical structure. Our next respondent is Milton Schimberg. Uh, Milton has practiced and taught architecture for more than four decades, sharing his insight from both venues um, with practitioners and students internationally, most recently in Stuttgart, Venice, Santiago de Compostela, and Porto. His work at the intersection of architecture, neuroscience, and art propels his long time practice, his beauty and brain seminar, and a book now in progress on the topic. Milton? Well, I'm coming at this from a slightly different direction. As a practicing architect and a practicing teacher, um, I'll just start by saying that where I come from is an accident. <laughs> I was standing in a bookstore, and in that bookstore, there was a section that was for architecture. And next to it, because it was alphabetical, was a section called art. And I literally bumped into E.H. Gombrich's book called Art and Illusion, which suddenly opened the doors to tell me that, in fact, you can talk about how people experience art, and there are ways to break it down in ways that you can apply to other things. So that's where I started. The second place I went was to Anjan's abstract, which I found extremely illuminating. And I think my comments will be more about the abstract, and I'll ask you to bring them back, bring them home to the, the talk. So one of the things you asked is why aesthetic responses matter. That's one of the questions I think is you know, why we're here. So as an architect and very definitely an amateur musician and, and an artist, I have no problem answering that question definitively. Aesthetic responses, I think, are valuable because they interrupt our routine. They give pause to reflect, always emotionally, sometimes intellectually, on underlying aspects of life that have importance and meaning. Certain, culturally, they help us engage in a deeper way with others. And they open us to empathic connections. And I think the, the place in the brain where empathy takes place is an area of research that I think uh, has a lot to say about this. Second, you talked about neuroaesthetics investigations aiming at the biology of aesthetic experience. And that's what you are so expert at, and I'm not. But I will just go to a question, which is whether there's a guiding underlying commonality in the brain's processing of visual art forms, visual art forms that appear to be quite different or apply to very different art activities. There's painting, sculpture, and architecture. And I'll add music to that as a visual 
art because a lot of what happens when you process music takes place in the visual cortex. So the thing that is common to all of them that I'd like you to com comment on, use the word tension. I'd like to ask you to comment on artistic tension, which I think also feels, feeds into architectural tension, which is creation of something that doesn't resolve cognitively quickly, that the skillful manipulation of the design is intended to withhold coming to closure, and that that's where the art experience takes place. So for example, in music, where a theme is created and hovers like Debussy and then gets resolved is a long span. That's a great deal of tension. In architecture, simple, more symmetrical facades tend to resolve more quickly. So it's that skillful manipulation. And I'm curious about how the brain deals with that because I think the experience of beauty can either be like this or like this. In Bach, it's short. In Debussy, it's long. In Baroque architecture, it's long. In the Sagrada Familia, it's long. I think those durations are worth talking about. So the other thing I'd like to have, get some comment back on is gut reactions. When people see architecture, oftentimes they say, I love it or art, I love it or I hate it, or they're indifferent to it. I'm curious about where that experience resides. And one of the things that you had mentioned that I'm very interested in uh, is the striatum, which I know very little about, but I've just bumped into it a few times, like Gombrich's book in the bookstore. And it seems to me that from what I've learned, that art occurs when that when the striatum, which is unconscious or preconscious, gets penetrated, gets its membrane gets pricked by something which is novel. And then the experience of art goes from being pre-conscious or non-conscious up into other parts of the cognitive process, maybe the way it engages the limbic system, the way it starts to engage the neocortex. It's that arousal that dictates how we really experience art and architecture. So what is the role of novelty? Buildings that are background buildings tend to fit into something that we don't have to pay constant attention to, but foreground buildings, which architects love to make, demand puncturing that background level. So that's how novelty occurs to me as part of the, the architectural rubric. I'm also curious to know more about something that I wonder is parallel, and that's neuronal voting and aesthetic voting. Whether the stimulus that gets us to make, to bring our attention to something that happens that is, is aesthetic can be described as voting, the strength of the signal, the meaningfulness of the signal, its importance in terms of how we're, in a, we're dealing with a context, as you mentioned, whether neuronal voting also has an, has an allegory or a parallel in aesthetic voting, whether it's the same thing is ultimately my question. And I think I'll leave it at that for now. There's more. Um, sometimes when I give talks, I uh, start talks, and I didn't do that this time, by saying uh, people are going to ask questions. They're going to be great questions, and my response is going to be nobody's done the experiment. <laughs> uh, and it is the kinds of deep intuitions that Milton has from having done this work for many years, uh, for us is the starting point, not the ending point, right? Those are hypotheses to be tested. And in my lab, I have uh, an artist in residence, I have an art historian, I have an anthropologist. And one of the common lines I use with them is part of the reason you're here is for me to get you to think like an experimentalist, right? So you start out with the notion of novelty, right? As an experimentalist, I want to know, well, are there different kinds of novelty? Who are we talking about? Who is it novel for? What's the context in which it's novel? What are the response you're interested in? Really ugly things are salient as are very beautiful things, right? So what kind of novelty? 
novelty is evolutionarily important for us to pay attention to, right? You have to be aware of something that's novel. Whatever the experience after that can vary, right? The first thing is to know that, okay, that's something I'm not expecting, right? So for us, that starts a path that would probably be 10 years of, of experiments to try to figure out what is this notion of novelty and what's happening in the brain with respect to that and under what context. Uh, and some of the other things, you mentioned the striatum, the, the ventral striatum is a very important structure for reward processing, particularly an area called the nucleus accumbens. Uh, the dorsal striatum has more to do with, uh, with motor movements, motor learning, um, and, uh, and learning in general. Uh, but the ventral striatum is really a core structure for all sorts of reward processing and is interconnected uh, with parts of orbifrontal frontal cortex, ventromedial prefrontal cortex, but it seems to be the core of our hedonic responses. So one way to think about rewards and pleasures is that there are broadly two systems, uh, which colloquially is sometimes referred to as the wanting and liking system. So the wanting system is driven by dopamine. Uh, and the liking system are opioids and cannabinoids. So sometimes when you hear people talk about dopamine as the pleasure chemical, that's not exactly right. What dopamine is, it's the incentive one. It's the thing that gets you to want to get to something you want. But the core pleasure is really uh, the cannabinoid and the, um, and the opioid systems. And you can think about uh, when drugs that tap into those systems for recreation, uh, that if you think about what is it that drives dopamine among drugs of use and abuse, it's cocaine, right? So that's a kind of, it's an activating drug, right? It's, it's stimulants, it's things that get you moving to get to something. Whereas if you think of the effects of opioids and pot, those are, they chill you, right? They're, they're sedating, they're, they're really about the, the sheer sensory pleasure of things, right? So those two systems operate in concert in most people. So the ventral striatum actually has receptors for both of those. And so they work very closely. However, there are situations, particularly with drug addicts in which they get disconnected where the incentive part, like people really crave and crave and crave, but then the pleasure starts decreasing, right? So they get disconnected. The fascinating question to me is, is an aesthetic experience in some ways the opposite of that, right? And I don't know experimentally how one would show that where, where you have, uh, you might on first principles say an aesthetic experience is one that is non-utilitarian, right? It is, as you were saying, it interrupts you. It's like, it's like you don't, it's not transitive in the sense that you can look at a beautiful painting and think I wanna buy that because it's a good investment or I'll impress my friends. Right, but those are not aesthetic. Those are valuations, but they're not necessarily aesthetic valuations. But is there an aesthetic valuation that is not about wanting that that is a pure hedonic experience of it itself? Right, and and whether you can show that experimentally, I don't know. But the systems are there, uh, I think, to allow that. So, yeah, I'm reminded of uh, Kant. Uh, disinterestedness, right? Um, and you know that's a true aesthetic where there is no interest involved, it's just pure. Okay, let me introduce Richard Villadesu, who is a professor emeritus in the Department of Theology at Fordham University. Um, Richard is a Roman Catholic priest with 50 years of pastoral experience serving in both the Latin and Lutheran uh, Byzantine rites. He has written extensively on philosophical theology, aesthetic, and um, homiletics. He's practicing artist and amateur musician as well as a writer. Richard, please. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Chatterjee, for, for such a very informative and for me, challenging uh, presentation, challenging from several points of view, but particularly because you showed how many variables there are in aesthetic judgments and architectural judgments. I come to this 
question not so much uh, as a student, a uh, professor of aesthetics, as I do from the point of view of a master who, practically speaking, are the people who really make decisions about what kind of church is going to be built. And I've had that pastoral experience, as uh, Julio said, in the Roman Catholic Church and in the Byzantine Church. The Byzantine Church, as you all know, I'm sure, have very strict canons of art and architecture. So even today, if you're building a Byzantine church, it has to be built at these, according to these centuries old canons, which have a didactic function, which is more or less known to the congregations. On the other hand, I've also served in the Roman Catholic Church in a number of Roman Catholic churches. And in the Roman Catholic Church, there has been there have been vast swings of the pendulum between the various values that Dr. Chatterjee uh, mentioned as being in play in architecture. And it raises for me the question precisely that this, uh, this symposium is about, what's the relation of sacred to architecture? Is good architecture always good sacred architecture? If so, what is it that makes it sacred? If not, what is it that is the challenge there? One of the uh, aspects that Dr. Chatterjee mentioned was the idea of hominess as something that's attractive, something that you don't find in Byzantine churches, except in the wide sense that uh, Dr. Chetty mentioned of feeling I should be here, that I belong here. But it's not homey in the normal sense of the word that it's like my home. No, it's purposely designed to be strange, to put you in a different world altogether. This was also part of the idea in Western churches for a very, very long time. And the liturgy for the consecration of a church, there's a line that's repeated in the Latin text uh, a number of times during the liturgy and song. It's kind of the theme of the whole dedication of a church, terribilis est locus iste, which could be translated literally, this is a terrible place which is unfortunately true of a whole lot of churches. But of course, the, the meaning of terribilis is awe-inspiring. This goes in with the idea of awe, fascination. But the church is not just ordinary. As again, Ben Milton said, it, it takes you out of your ordinary life and, and challenges it. In the Roman Catholic Church, there's been, as I said, a, a great deal of change. When I was, for example, when I was first ordained in the 1970s and went to a parish, I celebrated the liturgy. Every week I celebrated the liturgy more times in people's houses than in the parish church. It was a time when there was a great valuation of this idea of hominess, of being at home, that the the God is present always and everywhere, and you don't need a special place. If you want hominess, stay home, which a lot of people do on Sunday mornings, uh, particularly since the pandemic. And that, of course, got challenged, particularly during the pontificate of John Paul II. There was a, a challenge to that whole idea, which had been endorsed very much by the Latin American bishops, uh, in 1968, at their conference at Medellin, they explicitly endorsed the idea that came from Brazil of the Comunidades Ecclesiais de Base, the idea that the, the true church is the home church. That was challenged later on, along with the whole liberation theology that went along with it. And during the subsequent years, we had a, a return to the idea of the traditional church the church that is more oriented not to hominess, but to fascination and awe, and also challenge 
it's a uh, an old saw among the pastors that the purpose of religion, at least Christian religion, is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Of course, that doesn't have to mean that the building has to be uncomfortable. Although that again is frequently the case. A big challenge that Dr. Chatterjee's uh, talk poses for me is among all of the various values, how do you incorporate also, and you explicitly said that you do have to incorporate other elements, you know, visual aesthetics and place are one element of what happens in the church. For me, the functionality aspect looms very large as it would, of course, for a pastor in a church. What are we actually using this space for? And that will make a tremendous difference to what values you prioritize among the very many that uh, Dr. Chatterjee mentioned so very insightfully. So thank you. So if I could make a couple of comments, uh, several times uh, you uh, used the word challenging. It came up several times. And challenging is one of the terms that comes up in our semantic network. And it's particularly interesting because it is, uh, if you look at where it's located and how it disperses, on the one hand, it disperses towards uh, feelings, uh, clusters around anxiety and on the other towards edification. Uh, and so things that are challenging just hover between those. Uh, and one of the things we're interested in is what drives people to go in one direction versus the other. And so there are some empirically, uh, there are some empirical observations that points us into that direction, which is that one of the personality constructs that personality psychologists have identified is this notion of openness to experience. People who are open to experience take on challenges and they learn from challenges, whereas people who tend to be not so open to experiences tend to withdraw from them, right? They, they don't like them. It pushes them in that direction. And so part of the issue is, can we shift, you know, we're all malleable, right? So none of this is written in stone, but can you start shifting people? And it looks like uh, that a certain amount of context, a certain amount of education, probably what the kind of uh, uh, work that a pastor does in those situations, uh, maybe provides a vehicle for something that is challenging to shift towards edification and away from anxiety would be one possibility. Um, and then the other thing that, I, and this is extending uh, way beyond any of the data we have, but one thing you mentioned about this whole construct of hominess, which needs a lot of unpacking and whether in the context of the, the church, which is not homey in the usual sense that we think of our home, it's, it's otherworldly, whether part of the hominess is in not in the structure, but I also said buildings are in relation to people, whether it is the sense of community that you have with other people in there, that's part of the hominess of that setting uh, that was really relied on your being part of a community that happens to be in this otherworldly space. But that's pure speculation. I, I think that, that, I mean, that resonates with my experience that the the, uh, it's really the sense of people knowing one another uh, and associating with one another that makes it a, a, a holy experience, a pleasant experience, despite the fact that they're gathered there for something that could be at least challenging to them. <laughs> Was everything I said so far lost? <laughs> yes, yes but I, I think that that's I think that's very true. It's the the sense of of uh, communal belonging. And that, again, from a pastoral point of view, that creates a, a big problem, at least in the Roman Catholic Church. Our churches have to be big. Mm -hmm. And how do you get that sense of, of communion? The church that I've served for 30 years on Fire Island was a little church, held about 100 people. Everybody knew each other. And everybody felt this enormous sense of community. 
And during the high holidays, uh, it, it became a synagogue. And same was true of the Jewish community. Uh, the people knew each other outside of the synagogue, outside of the holy days. Uh, it also was interesting to me that uh, when the pandemic came, we had to have mass on the beach with the ocean 20 feet away. And even though the people loved their church, they adored this little simple wooden church, they loved being on the beach more. And that, that you, you mentioned that also, uh, nature and nature and built environment and the tension between them. I'd love to, love to hear more about that. I think it will be a good time now to open to the public, um, to the audience, because I think uh, there's not a lot of time left. So if there is any question from the, uh, or comment from the audience to uh, Anjan or to the panelists, um, please uh, raise your hand and we'll carry the, the phone to you. Yes. Welcome. Welcome. Uh, thank you very much. I wanted to ask about uh, the basis of your uh, data, uh, because uh, you began with your experience of Sagrada Familia, but that was an experience of being in Sagrada Familia. But did I understand correctly that in the gathering of the data, uh, it was uh, pictures of uh, that people were asked to respond to, or in the very last one, little videos, and it strikes me that the distinctive feature of architecture is that it is a place to be. Uh, and we might, picking up Father Richard's uh, theme, we might ask how important is the distinctive function of a sacred building? But I'm just interested in whether you think it's in any way problematic in exploring the people's responses. And I, may I just say also to the natural environments, because I think being in or being on the beach or whatever, um, and, and that's, I, I just wonder whether you think uh, concentrating, abstracting it to an essentially visual experience rather than an experience of presence uh, dis distracts, or I don't know what the right word is exactly, takes away from its value as data that might illuminate our response to architecture. Yeah, the problem is even uh, worse than you're alluding to, uh, which is that if you're doing uh, uh, an fMRI experiment, uh, movement is um, a huge is microphone. Oh, is it? Are you having me? Everybody hear me? Yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, what I said is the the problem you allude to is even greater than how you frame it. Uh, and it's greater because if you're doing an fMRI study, movement is anathema. If your head moves uh, half an inch, you get no data. So, so there is this huge paradox uh, at, that, that you allude to, which is that if what's constitutive of the experience of architecture is being physically in a three-dimensional space in which you are moving, we are doing something that has no bearing on that, right? If you wanted the experience of being in a coffin, then an fMRI experiment is perfect. <laughs> so be that as it may, I think what we end up doing is saying, can this be replicated with different versions given those limitations? Now, what is the goal? Ultimately, the goal would be to take things out into the wild. Right, so which is so you move them out of the laboratory, which gives you a great deal of control, and you take it out, and so you have this kind of uh, trade-off between ecological validity and control of what you're doing. Uh, but the other piece is you can't get the kind of neural data we get if you take it out in the wild. Now there are a couple of methods that are evolving, uh, which has to do with near infrared spectroscopy and mobile EEG that starts to give you some neural data in the wild. There are both technical and conceptual issues with that, which I, I feel confident in the next several years we will surmount uh, where we will start to be able to get neural information. Uh, but then you have all sorts of questions of what are you controlling? 
right? In my lab, one of another mantra is the question is the question, right? Until you know what the question is, you don't have an experiment. So, but your points are well taken. Uh, we are starting to collect behavioral data. Now that we have this taxonomy, we have something to hold on to. So for example, we're setting up an experiment of uh, Philadelphia, the city I live in, has uh, one of the most extensive mural arts programs where there are public arts, there are more than 4,000 murals in the city, in every part of the city. Uh, and we're trying to understand what is the experience of being in an urban environment. It can be a very poor environment, it can be a rich environment, where there is art there, a big public display of art versus one block adjacent, where it's the same socioeconomic class, but without art. What is the experience of physically being in the presence to, to, your, uh, to your point? Uh, but that we will be able to get behavioral data, uh, but not neural data. Right, and you might be able to get some eye recording, which is physiologic data. Uh, but so these are incremental steps in that direction. Uh, but I think strategically, it's a it would be a mistake for us to start out in the complex world, uh, to because then you've got just so much noise to deal with, uh, and trying to extract what's relevant out of that. Uh, I mean, people could do it. I I personally think that's probably it would probably not be the most fruitful way to go about it if you've got a long view of this. There's never any one experiment that answers anything in our world. Harrison yeah, uh, and then uh, Nathaniel, and then, and then we'll break up to stop. So I wanna pick up on who would do. I want to pick up on your comments about being in the place. Uh, especially as it relates to all the other sensory dimensions, um, especially your your work, because it seems to me the sound of a space, the smell of a space, the thermal interaction with the space on your skin, these are really powerful uh, presence that distinguish place from say other places. And it seems to me when in my book, we went back and looked at eight case studies, trying to assess the insights we thought neuroscience was giving us. And it seemed to me that the multi-sensory dimensions of these places was really surprising in terms of being powerful in our perception and cognition of their of their uh, special qualities. So somehow it seems to me we need to find a way to get to measuring some of those things because, um, you know, and I'm going to show an example where I think all of those senses are just so powerful that they overwhelm a visual um, assessment only. Not that the visual isn't incredibly important, but these other ones almost lie in this pre-conscious space and are part of the original, at, you know, the preliminary intuitive assessment, the gut that you talked about, you know, of your reading of the space. So I'd love to know, I love the fact that you're an experimentalist. I'm looking for experimentalists to help me figure out how to make these things um, understandable in terms of the um, biology of the brain. Yeah, so you're absolutely right. Uh, I think Jonathan is going to talk about sound later. Uh, sound is tremendously important, especially as it relates to these kinds of environments. Uh, smell, for sure. Every real estate agent knows that, you know, <laughs> bake some bread if you want a sense of hominess, right? This is, these are, these are things people know. Um, I think the the uh, again it brings back to if you're going to do experiments, how do you control for those variables, right? And that's this is a practical issue, not uh, and especially if you're working in a field in which there is no funding. I mean that's another reality of what we're dealing with, right? So the uh, experiments are expensive; they're hard and they're expensive, and it's a long view. And unless there's money to do it, you can't start addressing the issues you're talking about. 
Having said that, I'll tell you one, uh, one, what we're taking from our laboratory work into kind of a, uh, moving it into a practical domain, which will incorporate some of this, which is not very far from here. We're involved with a group that is uh, uh, right now in the process of uh, building a, um, uh, a mental health facility for people who are recovering from addiction. We are engaged with them with the idea that within that facility, uh, we are designing uh, refresh rooms where they where we're using everything we're learning visually, but we're going to incorporate sound, possibly smell. Um, we're very conscious of the textures of the material that are going to be in it. And uh, you know, broadly, when people talk about these kinds of rooms, uh, there uh, there are two broad domains, which is that it helps with. Uh, attention, something called attention restoration theory, uh, and there it helps with emotional regulation. Um, you know, those are very common ideas in the field. We've done an experimental study at Penn and showed that none of that stuff actually happens, right, if you do it in a short period, right? So for us, a lot of our intuitions have to be cashed out in experiments, right? We have the intuitions leeches were wonderful for thousands of years. So, but having said that, and we have reasons why we think our experiment didn't work, right? So then you push past that to say what was problematic with the experiment until eventually you give up on your idea if none of the experiments work. But in this place, what we are hoping to do is incorporate all of the senses in the way that you're talking about and get behavioral data with the idea that we are taking a, a very special population, extreme population, that we might be able to move the needle on that way and then have it be an iterative design where we're finding out from them what they think worked and what didn't over time so we can adjust accordingly. But this is slow and incremental work. So um, I share the fascination already expressed by a number of people with this observation you made that it seems as though many people like to see a little order in nature, but a little nature in their architecture. And as an architectural historian, I think, you know, look, you could find all over the world, whether you're looking at Japanese traditions or Mayan traditions, you'll find innumerable examples that would back you up in this. Um, but when I'm thinking of these examples, uh, it occurred to me that I want that this, uh, that you, you use the word permeability, um, but that it, it often the, the permeability of nature and order in these traditions seems to me that there might be a, another distinction to make, maybe even an equivalence, and that it's not a, a dialectic of opposites, but rather an attempt to reconcile. So, if, so when I think about the, the elements of nature that are most often applied in architectural contexts, they're not disorderly ones, they're flowers. The, you know, the symmetry of a flower, the symmetry of a climbing vine. And I'm wondering if, if, there's, a, if there's a way to, to, to a kind of geolocate order and nature in the same spot in the human brain uh, as applies to architecture. Until the last point, can you repeat that? Can you repeat that one? <laughs> I wonder if it's possible to, to, to see order and nature not as a dialectic of opposites, but rather as something that is that, that human the human brain finds mutually reinforcing, considering the fact that when we look to art look to nature and try to abstract it into architecture, humans tend to go for orderly forms like yeah. snowflakes, crystals, flowers, things that are that are decipherable as ordered. Yes, yeah, interesting idea. I hadn't thought about it quite that way, uh, and I'll have to think about it more. Uh, I think when I started this idea of you know our brains. That, most of our, you know, we're an old brain in a new environment, right? So that the way in which we respond to the environment is a, is part of how we are responding to the built uh, environment as well and trying to resolve that tension as part of it. There's another piece to this, which is, I mean, you mentioned Japanese and various other kinds of cultural uh, uh, traditions. Part of the reason in that one of the slides of putting Uluru in there as this, you know, really, I mean, it's an extraordinary space having been there, right? I could have started instead of Sagrada Familia talking about what it was like to camp around there for three nights. Uh, 
right? But this is a place that has, there is a serious kind of resonance there, whatever you want to call it. And now if you are going to build in that space, how do you build as an architect? How do you build in a way that is, uh, is respectful of the space, which might be very different than if you're building in a rainforest, right? And that's a challenge for you guys. But when I talk about permeability, I'm meaning that it's in conversation with the location itself. And among the most disturbing built environments to me are where they are completely disconnected from the physical place. And uh, you know, this is particularly salient to me right now is I was recently uh, at a, the, a wedding of the daughter of a friend of mine uh, that was in Denver, stunningly beautiful physical environment. And at least the parts that we were in was miles and miles and miles of anonymous sterile developments. Uh, and it, the, the contrast was just shocking. Whoever is like designing these spaces, there's no acknowledgement of, of the space. That there's, it's, you know, that could have been in Plano, Texas. It could have been anywhere, right? Uh, so that, that to me is disturbing where there's no communication, where the building has no communication with its environment. There's a question. This was really, really wonderful. So everyone up there, thank you very much. Um, I have nothing to do with the arts. I'm a canon lawyer here. Uh, but as a Carmelite, our rule speaks a lot about the nature of the place because we were founded on a mountain. And as I was listening, uh, particularly to the, the lead speaker, the presenter, the notion of familiarity kept coming up in my mind. Like, what's the role of the familiar? Like, that place in Denver struck you as sterile, but what if you lived there for 20 years? You know, like, does it lose its sterility, I guess? Or like, what's the nature, role, or place of familiarity in, in this discussion, I suppose? Yeah, I mean, I, I would, uh, uh, I, I'm going to answer your question, but I also would like Milton as a practicing architect to comment about this as well. <laughs> because I don't want to be uh, dominate the conversation, but let me just address your, your question. So familiarity is an interesting thing, which is that uh, there is, in aesthetics research, there is a prominent notion called fluency, and the things that are fluent and often which are processed more easily tend to, tend to be liked. Uh, and familiarity is one of those things that people tend to like it. But it, it is, it intersects acts with a level of complexity. Things that are very simple, we get bored of if when they're familiar. Familiarity also breeds contempt, right? So it's like, what's that magic where familiarity, it has to be complex enough that with repeated viewing, uh, it's still, it gets familiar and, and you still tend to enjoy it. And so I think, uh, I can't remember, maybe it was Milton, you, you talked about the difference between very short-term responses and longer duration responses. I think the more complex it is, the longer duration responses, uh, it matters, uh, familiarity starts to matter when it's, it's complex. Uh, but this issue uh, of living in a place like that, that I experienced as sterile for 20 years, I have no idea what that would be like, but Milton, as a designer, I, I really, uh, as an architect- I refuse to take responsibility for that. Miles of sterile buildings that are <laughs> one way. Context is everything in design, and the context can be the surroundings, it can be nature, it can be an urban or even a suburban context, but context is also the people who are in it. And if we don't deal with that, then we have incoherent environments, which are inherently stressful. So I think we can go from familiarity, which is that brief moment, to a stretched uh, engagement, which takes longer. But if we go too far beyond that, we break that connection. When you see the kind of contrast you're describing in Denver, it's broken. It's not there. And I think the resonance between what you make and how you invite people to experience it is maybe the critical thing in architecture. And the word that I think is missing uh, is empathy. Empathic design means that you take all those things into consideration as you design, 
Um, un unempathic architecture, we all know we have gut reactions to it. It's not about us. And at that point, we are alienated from it, and that becomes a real problem. Um, while I've got the mic, I'll make one quick comment related to scientific research versus the intuitive approach of architects. And when you describe experimental noise, um, I completely get it. It makes it very hard to come up with replicable results or even the kinds of insights that you're really seeking. The dilemma in architecture, I think in part, is that it's the noise that we're dealing with as the good thing. So it's a little bit hard to balance out how you approach the complexity of an environment with the ability to distill out of that certain factors which are important. I know we, we've talked about this a bit. It's a struggle between um, a worldview that looks for grasping definite answers and a worldview that looks for the richness of the experience. One last question. Uh, before we go to the reception with some wine. Robbie, thank you. I'll make this quick, but I was um, interested also, Anjan, in your comparison of the law students to the architecture students. And I'm wondering how much you're taking into consideration the kind of formation that your communities are having. So I have this, I have a similar uh, problem. Sorry, say the last bit again. Well, we, it's a good Catholic word, formation, you know? Um, but we talk about the, just the, not just training, but the kind of dispositional beings of people of certain kinds of communities. So in my, in my problem is I have, you know, theology students as subjects, but I also have design students and I might have psych majors and they're going to have a very different sets of responses in, in, in their work. How much are you considering that angle? Yeah, so these are always hard because the question, uh, you know, the, the unanswerable question for a uh, a sectional design like that is, is this about their education or is it about the predispositions people have that choose to go into architecture, choose to go into law or choose to go into theology, right? Yeah, you know, unless you started doing studies that, you know, people who are three and four years old and track them for a long time, uh, that's an unanswerable question. Um, so, uh, you know, I, the, the sort of milk toast answer is probably a bit of both, but you know, but you know, but in this case, what we're as I think is self-evident, we're trying to at least get parity in educational level and ambition and those kinds of things, those other characterologic things. But really, what's what you know, what difference is one versus the other that way? So. Okay, let's uh, give them a hand for a great. Uh, so before we we uh, we move out of here, let me say a few things. One is uh, we started.